Hey, howdy. Hey, my Bruin brothers and sisters. We're back with another live episode of uh, Brew Strong here with my good friend, Fal Allen. Uh, beer genius and, uh, you know, you, you've been around, you've been around much longer than your years would suggest. You know, you, you've got your barley wine book, you get your Goza book. Um, you've been successful in this country, other countries around the world brewing beer um you just have an amazing history i'm very lucky yeah well i think you make your own luck yeah to some degree <laughs> but i you know i have been right place right time a few times so right right well yeah uh you know whatever you can do to, to make yourself lucky um you know you gotta do and, and, and it is sometimes just seeing the opportunity and being willing to do the hard work to, to make make things happen. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Well, look at John Blickman, uh, our good friend. He uh, yeah. has Blickman Engineering. This makes all that cool brewing gear that innovates your brew day. Uh, they have that available. Uh, most brew shops, you know, carry it or can get it for you. So check out your local homebrew shop. Ask them, you know, what Blickman gear they have. They got, you know, uh, everything from the basic Anvil series up to the, uh, the high-end uh, uh, Blickman gear and then Pro stuff as well. If you want to get into into pro brewing and you're already brewing on Blickman gear, uh, check them out for the pro stuff. One, one thing I know is that John Blickman really takes quality seriously and and believes in uh, in the customer and makes sure the customer is, is taken care of. So uh, he's a great guy. He's paid for the show for 15 years. So if you get a chance, uh, check out Blickman Engineering. Uh, uh, they're uh, they're out there uh, on the web uh let's see here questions uh you did the the uh the barley wine book uh how many years ago um i think that came out in 98 so what is that 24 years it's like 100 yeah it feels like 124 100. wow that is a long time ago you were just you're just a child back then still a, a young man a young, young whippersnapper. Were you old enough to drink when you wrote that book? Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I co co authored it with Dick Cantwell, who's uh -huh. a great brewer and a very knowledgeable yeah. guy yeah. and a much better writer than I am. Uh, is, thank you for that, um, Dick. But uh, we had early on, we used to brew together at a place called Pike Place Brewery in Seattle. And you know, we had both started writing beer articles and he said, so if someone asked you which of the style guidelines series books, what would you, what, what would you want to do? And we both said at the same time, barley wine, uh, because, you know, right. you make good barley wine, you make a good other beer because it's a really hard style. It's high mm -hmm. alcohol, you know, a lot of technical issues. So one day the woman who was running the brewer's publication said to me, would you, would you like to write one of our style guideline books? And if so, which one? Well, obviously, barley wine. <laughs> and then I kind of had a built-in partner, Dick, because, you know, he'd already said the same thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I like that book, and uh, I love good barley wine, you know? And there's such a range to them, too. Uh, let's see here. Uh Giles asks, uh, I'm hoping to brew my first barley wine soon, but I have an issue with my mash tun size. I don't have access to a larger mash tun and the highest gravity I can reach with a full size mash is about 1080, um, which is about right. I mean, it tends to max out around 1080, 1085 anyways. Um, the target original gravity for my barley wine will be 1.100. So my question is, since I don't want to use extract, should I do two no sparge mashes to get my volume and gravity? And what would the potential drawbacks of that option be? Or would I be better served doing one mash with my specialty grains and a separate mini mash with the rest of my base grains to hit my gravity? I considered using my first runnings for my sparge if I did uh, the double mash, but I'm afraid of leaving too much behind in the mash if I did that. If it matters, I do batch sparging. Thanks. 
You have any thoughts on that? You know, I think his his initial idea of two separate, you know, two mashes, two times mm -hmm. is probably your best option. I don't really like the idea of doing a separate mash with your specialty, you know, with your specialty grain. Right. All together, I think you get a little more cohesive flavor. Probably also get a little better extract because mm -hmm. you know your specialty malt doesn't have a lot of enzymes. Right. Your main mash will. So you know, mashing twice is a little bit of a pain, but you're going to get the gravity you want. Mm -hmm. Basically, the same thing. I mean, the drawback would be if something went really wrong with one of your mashes, mm -hmm. but that's always a potential problem. So right. I, that would be the best bet. Mm -hmm. And to his point about, you know, losing some gravity by not sparging, well, that's always going to be the case with these big beers. But you can do what they do in England. Just do, you know, a, a second beer, beer a small beer, yeah. which I think that those are great beers. So it's kind of a win-win, but it does make for, for a long brew day. Yeah, that's an excellent point on on making the small beer afterwards. Um, yeah, there's there's really no waste. Um, yeah, the uh, he doesn't want to use extract. I think the extracts have also gotten quite good these days. I don't see a problem with boosting your um, your uh, your your gravity with you know really high quality fresh uh, DME or liquid liquid malt extract and uh, uh, you know, getting the rest of your gravity that way, especially, you know, there's really nice, uh, you know, extracts made from Maris Otter that have a great, you know, malty character to them. Perfect for a barley wine, uh, a lot of options there. And then there's some, some really light extracts that don't add a lot of flavor that, you know, are just, uh, you can add in there and, uh, you should be adding some simple sugars as well. Um, most barley wines uh, don't they have a, a simple sugar component to them especially yeah, I think ones. it's a british style and it was pretty common for breweries to add you know somewhere between 10 and 15 percent sucrose of mm -hmm. some sort um in there so i wouldn't you know i wouldn't shy away from that either i mean if you can get your you know gravity to say 10 70 or 75 and you really want to be at 80 or 85 add some add some sugar i don't think in a beer like that it will show much mm -hmm. certainly won't be able to taste the sugar you know what you may get is you know that higher alcohol effect a little bit but I, when we do barley wines we usually add somewhere between five and ten percent mm -hmm. of sugar and we did that with our triple and our, our double as well right and um one of the things he mentions is, I think, a double mash, um, which uh, we started calling it uh, polyguile oh, yeah. instead, of, instead of party guile, polyguile. You you take the uh, the runnings from the first mash and add it to another set of grain. Um, and what I found is it's it's additive. It's strictly additive. There's hardly any loss uh, whatsoever. Um, and so you could take take that grain, and if you're getting 1080 out of it, and uh, you do the same thing again using your your runnings, you'll get 160. Yeah, you know it it just adds together. So yeah, I had mentioned this to Blickman at some conference. Uh, somebody was was talking about the size of a kettle or something, and and so Blickman went ahead and did some some tests on that, doing that exact thing, and. He's like, yeah, they just the numbers add. It's strictly additive. I wouldn't think that would that would work, but it does. Sure. And, okay. uh, and so uh, I actually ended up doing a beer with Yepa from uh, Evil Twin, um, where we we did kind of a double version of our Evil Twin beer, and, and we did a a, a quadruple version, uh, fifteen percent. Um, version of it and we did the that that mash uh, technique where we took the word out cleared our lotter ton and then dowed in another set of grains using the uh using the first runnings and uh had no trouble getting up to uh <laughs> the gravity we needed like what was it 30 play-doh 31 32 something like that 
That's amazing. Yeah, I, I didn't think it would work. But after Blickman did that testing, I was just like, well, this will work. And sure enough, it did. I don't I try that I, now. It, you know, just logically, you wouldn't think it would. It'd be, you know, pretty substantial loss. I mean, I would think that you get like 50% gain, but really getting close to 100% gain. That's yeah, yeah. It's pretty cool. It's not off at all. And and I don't understand how it works because you would think you need, you know, a certain, you know, osmotic, you know, right. gravity of water for, you know, penetrating the, the, the starches and all this and the hydrating everything. But it just, it, it works. And the water well, still guess, goes out and goes into the grain. And I guess the saturation level of, of sugar into liquid is so much lower than that that you're like sure fine we can do that right not right. saturated or anywhere near i guess there's got to be a limit to it but yeah. um you know most people when they they do a maximum uh, uh amount of grain you know the the most they can get on their runnings is is about you know 1080 1085 and that's where it just tops out why it works additively i don't know um Let's see. Uh, I still need to come out and do a uh, do a collab with you. Absolutely, we're and down. Maybe we could do the the uh, polyguile. Uh, yeah, on something. Yeah, hey, do I, a barley one. Alcohol always sells well. A barley one, yes. All right. Um, let's see here. Got to take a short break. When we come back, we'll have more of your questions right after this. All right, we're back. We're talking uh, Q and A. Your your questions answered here. A lot of these people have sent in over the years. Um, you can send them in to uh, Bruce Strong at thebrewingnetwork.com, and I have vowed to answer every question uh, that has been sent in. If it kills me one way or another, I'm getting them done. So uh, we we keep uh, keep doing that, and people keep sending questions in. Uh, here's one from. Just uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, Terry asks, uh, greetings. First, thanks for all you uh, do for the brewing community. Can't say enough. Uh, can't say thank you enough. In an upcoming Q&A, could you review recommendations for storing Belgian beers? I've got a Belgian blonde ale that has done pretty good in competitions, and I've noticed it starting to decline in scoring. I've been storing it around 36 degrees and uh, I assume Fahrenheit. And this has got me thinking, uh, maybe I should be leaving this type uh, of style in the basement to age. Curious how you'd recommend storing aging Belgian blondes, doubles, triples, and these types of ales. Thank you in advance, Terry. How do you store your Belgian beers? Do you store Belgian beers? I, uh, I you know, I store them a little warmer than 36. I've read that kind of your optimal range is somewhere between the high 30s and the high 40s. So mm -hmm. I'm somewhere around 45, mm -hmm. 50. Um, kind of cellar temperature. Yeah. And by and large, I don't store beer anymore. Mm -hmm. I drink it as fast as I can, which isn't always that fast. Um, but even with, with Belgian beers, with a few exceptions, they don't get a lot better with age. Now, some people might disagree with this, but it's a matter of taste because I think, you know, hoppy beers certainly fall apart quickly. Mm -hmm. the, the hop degrades and they don't store very well at all. Darker, less hoppy beers store better. Mm -hmm. And there's science behind that. The hops aren't in there to fall apart and, you know, oxidize and do all kinds of weird things. The dark color, the, the melanoidin is a receptor for oxygen. So those beers oxidize less and mm -hmm. slower. Um, and I think that the darker flavor covers some of that oxidation and works better with it. You get this kind of sherry, pruney, port flavors mm -hmm. um, that I think work well with dark malt and they don't work well in say, you know, your, your West Coast IPA. Mm -hmm. So, you know, for any lighter, hoppier beers, I just drink them as quick as I can. If someone gives me a beer and it goes more than about a month, I'm suspect as to whether it's going to be any good mm -hmm. and then darker beers i usually try and get to them quick too because they don't always do well i've opened a few lately that i've been very disappointed wish i'd consumed them sooner mm -hmm. 
but there is an exception. There are a couple. I bought a case of Rochefort mm -hmm. and the first beer out was not that great. I thought, that's not what I remember. So I put it in the closet and it went about a year before I pulled the next one out and it was better. Mm -hmm. And I was like, huh, that's weird. You wouldn't think that it'd be noticeably better. Maybe it's just my memory. And so I let it sit for another six months or so. And they just kept getting better and better until, you know, after about four years, that 24 pack was gone. Mm -hmm. And the, the last one was the best one. Yeah, and I, I think, you know, there's there's always something going on, even if something is, you know, pure and clean. There is, you know, the um, act of time and temperature and gravity, um, you know, the uh, dropout of, you know, ultrafine particles, you know, improves the head retention, improves, you know, uh, clarity of the beer, the, uh, and it can affect flavor as well. But, you know, a, a lot of times, for most homebrewed beers, I would say that, you know, there's a, a fairly high chance that there is, you know, some sort of other organism in there. And that may be changing beers over time. Uh, sometimes the beers aren't 100% attenuated as much as the yeast can do. And the yeast will keep working as you, as you store it, even at 36 degrees. Uh, the yeast can keep working and, you know, that's going to change the beer. Perhaps it gets a little little uh, thinner, uh, maybe less sweet, you know, maybe the sweetness was balanced before and now it's dried out a little bit and losing that sweetness. Uh, maybe the beers come out of balance and that's why it's, you know, not as good. Uh, so I'm with you. I generally, if a beer tastes great, that's the time to drink it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. And uh, go, go for it in droves. Yeah. You know, and I think you're absolutely right that everything has its arc, you know, it's a bell curve. Mm -hmm. And, you know, even we have our peak point. Yeah. I'm not there yet, of course, myself. Oh, but, mine, mine was a long time ago. I don't know if you know that. Uh, but, you know, if you have yeast still in the beer, that protects it for a certain length of time. Mm -hmm. But eventually that yeast autolyzes. Yes. It either, you know, self autolyzes or it just gets so old it breaks apart and decays and that releases the the inner you know cell cytoplasm into the beer and that has a flavor of its own mm -hmm. so if you're storing your beers whether they're belgian or whatever and they're on yeast that that changes your your bell curve mm -hmm. and it's something to be very aware of because those flavors are rarely uh additive they're almost always kind of meaty and unpleasant mm. so there's another thing to keep in mind you know what conditions that beer is in did it have yeast did it have a lot of hops right and for this this for terry here uh who writes in i think his blondale being blonde right. is going to have a much shorter bell curve than say a double mm -hmm. you know that would because of the dark color would be able to age longer better mm-hmm so what what would you say would improve storing those lighter Belgian ales? Would it be, you know, filtering out the yeast, or you know, first, uh, or if you don't have filtration, you know, letting it sit in the keg for, you know, a couple of months, cold, let everything, you know, as much drop out, and then package it, or uh, yeah, I think you know what else lagering that beer really cold would help i think you know part of making a shelf stable beer goes back to the brew house so you got to do the right things in the brew house to get mm -hmm. you know all of that taken care of you right. don't have a good solid boil you're not going to precipitate some of the things that need to come out of there you're not going to drive off uh, some of the sulfur compounds so you know the longevity of a beer starts in the brew house probably actually starts out in the field somewhere but we don't have any control over that. Mm -hmm. But, you know, you got to make a good beer, a good solid beer in the brew house. And then as it moves through fermentation, make sure you do a good job there. And after fermentation, you need to exclude oxygen as, mm -hmm. you know, as much as you possibly can, which is harder for home brewers. Right. And, you know, it would help to get all that yeast out of there mm -hmm. one way or the other through filtration or, you know, aging. But then you don't have anything to scavenge that 
oxygen, so you really got to be careful packaging it. Oh, and you know, you 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 bring up uh, uh, you know just the process from you know one of the things uh, that I was told is um, the amount of heat uh, load that the beer has had in being created shortens its shelf life. So, and it has to do even with, you know, like uh, crystal caramel malts. Um, you know, they more heat was applied when they were malted. Um, seems to re kind of reverse itself on, on some of the black malts where, where but um, that, the amount of heat put in the mash, the amount of heat put in the, the loudering, the amount of heat in the boil, uh, excessive boiling can actually shorten the, the your shelf life. So I, and I see a lot of home brewers and, and, and a fair number of commercial brewers just boiling the daylights out of the work. You know, it's like a little is good, a lot's better. Um, and uh, that could possibly be shortening the, uh, the stability of your beer as well. So uh, only boil as much as you need. You're not wasting energy and uh, it, uh, it'll turn out better. Uh, let's see. Uh, Daniel writes, Jamel, uh, looking for your input on lowering the final gravity of a barley wine after primary fermentation finished. Background, I created a barley wine with an OG of 1086 and used Lagunitas yeast obtained from an awesome rally in Chicago. The yeast was used to create a two liter starter and primary fermentation ran for two weeks with a final gravity of 1024. This produced an attenuation of 71%, which is the highest that the Lagunitas yeast, Y yeast uh, 1968, is rated at. I was thinking now, uh, pitching a starter of White Lab super high gravity yeast to try and get it lower. Maybe add 1% to 2% ABV. This worked for me in the past with a huge Russian Imperial Stout, but it wasn't drinkable for six months, and it had a bigger and broader grain bill. Thoughts, questions, concern, advice. Thanks, Evan. All right, thanks, uh, Daniel. Um, hmm. I mean, I'm real leery of trying to get something started after it's attenuated 71%. I mean, you might eke out another small point or two, but you're not going to, uh, you're not, I, I doubt you're going to get it down enough for another 2% ABV. Mike, if you added the right yeast, in the right, absolutely right conditions. Like if you went to a champagne yeast mm -hmm. or, you know, I, I've heard tell that this Kvike yeast, which we'll know about in a few more days, I'll know more about it, but I've heard that it can really take a beer down a long way. But, you know, having said that, I think your point's a good one. You're not gonna get a lot more because there's no oxygen mm -hmm. and yeast needs oxygen to, to ferment. So yeah. if you just put it into a, finished beer, you got two things going against you. There's no oxygen. So that's going to be hard for that yeast to get going. It can only go on the glycogen and reserves that it already has. And it's in, you're putting it into a toxic environment that contains both ethanol and some carbonation, some CO2 mm -hmm. is, you know, entrained in that liquid. And both of those are things yeast don't like. So right. it's going to be hard for that yeast to really get going. I would I would consider maybe throwing in a little bread. There. They don't, they, they will finish up almost anything under right. almost any conditions, but it does take a long time and right. you're going to end up with some bread flavors. Right. But it uh, could, could be interesting in a, in a barley wine to uh, have some bread. Absolutely. Yeah. I think it'd be delicious. Yeah. I would, that, that, that would probably be what I would try. I would give that a go. Uh, let's see here. So, oh, Kvike yeast, final pH water chemistry question. Uh, Steve asks, hi, very time, very long time listener, first time question. Uh, first off, I started brewing about the same time Jamel started his show. I have truly listened to every episode, some multiple times. My brewing Bibles have been Jamel and John's books. They are stained and tatty and referenced and notated. So thanks much, so much sincerely for basically training me over the last almost two decades. Oh my God, I'm old. 
Uh, I recently tried Kvike yeast of the three beers I've used this yeast on. All have ended up perceivably more acidic than the same recipes using my regular yeast, Cal Ale yeast. I use RO water and treat it minimally with calcium carbonate and calcium sulfate. And if necessary, lactic acid. I shoot for 100 parts per million calcium and the sulfate carbonate ratio varies depending on the beer. pH is calculated with a spreadsheet and lactic acid or rarely baking soda is used to target a mash pH of 5.5 at room temperature. The Kvike -like beers I discovered and then confirmed in a paper online, drop the pH lower than other yeast strains. Here's the actual question. If I adjust the pH up in the mash to the upper end of uh, recommended mash pH with salts, will that translate to a higher pH in the beer after fermentation? In other words, how can I end up with a less acidic beer using this yeast strain? Kettle additions, perhaps? Thanks so much for the years and years of brewing discussion, Steve. Uh, from Melbourne Beach, Florida. See what you've done to this poor man? You've got him, <laughs> you, you started him brewing. Yeah, 20, 20 years of listening to me. Um, yeah, that's, that's, a. Uh, that's, yeah, I <laughs> don't know what to say. There, there are apparently three or four strains or variations on the Kvike yeast. Um, so it'd be interesting to know which one he used and because I think they all are slightly, you know, they, they have mm -hmm. different flavor profiles and probably different acid production profiles. Right. And some of them have more bacteria in them than others. Mm -hmm. So it'd be interesting to know what strain he used um, and where it came from. But all, all, all yeast produ produce different amounts of different you know byproducts and, right mm -hmm. so sure. it's interesting i don't i don't know if adjusting the ph would cause that yeast to behave differently or if it would just produce as much acid as it felt it needed i, th I think it, it might slightly change the behavior but i think it's uh if you start with a higher ph you'll end with a higher ph I think yeah. that will be will be the case. Another option is you can adjust your pH after fermentation. Yeah. So if you're going to add, you know, um, essentially caustic, you know, a lot of commercial brewers will add a little caustic to uh, to bump their uh, their pH, you know, um, or you know, uh, so post ferment adjustments are are allowed. Uh, so you can give that a try. Uh, but yeah, we definitely if you if you if you bump up your starting pH, your your finishing pH will be a bit higher. Would you uh, would you do that adjustment with sodium hydroxide? Um, I I have tasted beers that have been adjusted with sodium hydroxide. On Actually, purpose? it's just fine. Yeah, I mean you have right. to you have to be careful. It doesn't have all the other you know uh, yeah. stuff in it. You know all the uh, surfactants and, and, and surfactants. Yeah. yeah. Okay. The, the other thing that comes to mind is I read a, an article somewhere that talked about how some of this acid production in, in some yeast is tied to gravity. So hmm. the more alcohol it makes, the more acid it makes. Sure. So if you have a, a lower gravity beer, it's just going to produce you know, less acid than, mm -hmm. than it would in a, a higher gravity beer. Mm -hmm. So that might be one way to control it as well. That's an interesting thought. Yeah, that, that makes that makes perfect sense because I mean they're they're producing the acids out of the the act of fermenting. So the more they ferment, the more acid they'll produce. Um, yeah, that brings up some interesting questions for them. Let's see here. All right. Uh, let's take another short break, and when we come back, we'll have more of your questions right after this. I wanted to uh, tell you about uh, my friends at Brew Chatter. Uh, they're up in Reno, uh, Sparks, Nevada, to be to be exact, uh, but real close to Reno. Uh, they have a great homebrew shop up there. You can check them out online, brewchatter.com. They got all the goodies if you want to make uh, anything from barley wine to uh, uh, the Kvike yeast. They've, they've got it all. I've, I've known them for, for some years now, and... Uh, uh, just love those guys. Josh, RJ, wonderful folks, very knowledgeable. 
Uh, they'll treat you like, you know, you're the only customer in the world. Uh, good folks, check them out, brewchatter.com. All right, uh, let's see here. We've got a question from Jason about increasing yeast viability. He said, hey, during uh, yeast counting with our bottom cropping, with our bottom cropping from the cone of our fermenters, we continuously get about 65% viability, which I know is too little. How do we increase this? We have so far just been pitching dry yeast from up top. I know you have said to rehydrate the dry yeast in previous podcasts, but one of our employees had attended a yeast seminar a few years back and said that we should, that should not be a problem, not hydrating it. But I still wonder if it affects the flocculated yeast at the bottom. What do you think? What's your, what's your take on that, Sal? Well, first, I'd be curious to know how they're checking their viability. 65% is incredibly low for, mm -hmm. you know, a yeast to repitch. Right. We don't here at the brewery, you know, pitch anything below 90 unless we're in some sort of emergency situation. Mm -hmm. uh, so we really look for, you know, yeast 89% or above, and really we'd like it 95 or above. Mm -hmm. So the method that they're using to check that viability may be in question mm -hmm. and they may be getting you know, a false reading. Right. Um, so I would check that. I would, you know, uh, take a look at how you're checking that viability and look at other options to check it and maybe go through your methodology, make sure you're not, you know, over staining if you're using a stain or, you know, however you're doing it. Um, then, then, you know, the, your next question is that's, that's pretty darn low. Why is it so low? And then there are a lot of very variables here how old is it when you're checking it is it post fermentation a month or post fermentation a week mm -hmm. so that's going to have a lot to do with it and viability while stored can be very strain specific uh when i was brewing in singapore i i had a strain that produced these awesome flavors i loved the yeast strain for the flavors but if I let it go more than two or three days at the bottom of the fermenter, my viability started to crash dramatically. Mm. And so unless you're just brewing constantly, I could never, mm -hmm. it couldn't keep that yeast going. So I had to change strains to one that had, you know, uh, more longevity. And the next strain I used that I didn't have that problem at all. It lasted, you know, up to about three weeks. So it can be very strain dependent. Um, and then are you keeping, you know, is the, is the cone of your fermenter chilled mm -hmm. or is it, you know, is it room temperature? Right. In that cone, when the yeast packs down in there, um, you can get some real heating going on. You need to be careful and you can't really keep it in there a long time. Also, I wonder if they're pitching dry yeast, um, you know, there may be some, you know, loss, uh, of the dry yeast. And, you know, if you're just taking the very first yeast that come out of that, that, that cake at the bottom, you may be getting the stuff that dropped real early and, and died off early and maybe further into the creamy center of the, of the yeast mass, you get something with a higher viability. Yeah, it is kind of odd that 65 um, and con it says consistently. Um, yeah, I would wonder like you're saying, the temperature, the timing, I would reconfirm your, your lab methods by, you know, perhaps, uh, you know, getting, you know, some sort of known sample that, that has high viability and then testing it and see, you know, or maybe there's another brewery that that's getting high viability and, and they'd be willing to uh, test your yeast and see what they come up with. Um, that, that could be, you know, uh, I don't know where he's located, um, but there's labs around, you know, in California that would do that for you. Uh, not very expensive. And, you know, it would, you know, once you work out that your viability testing is correct, that's a huge tool that you can use uh, in the future. So it's worth getting that dialed in, I would think. Um, yeah, uh, I'm not sure why. It, it could be other things. It could be you know, the types of beers they're brewing, perhaps they're brewing something really, you know, 
super high gravity and you know, they're getting you know some loss maybe they're uh, you know they're repitching and they're not using any nutrients um, you know maybe they're you know their water and and other uh, adjustments are not um, you know conducive to that uh, so yeah there's a lot of questions I would I would have a lot of questions I'd have to see it myself to yeah. kind of figure out why yeah that's a it's a pretty broad and topic and tough question to answer without knowing yeah. a lot more detail yeah so Jason if that's still going on you know try some of those things and then um, you know reach back out if if that's still not working for you um, and maybe we can figure something out to uh, resolve that. Uh, let's see, Adam asks in the, in the chat, he says, uh, speaking to historical beers and brewing from the earlier show and Fowl's beautiful kettles. You got some beautiful kettles on you, dude. Yep. Uh, it's been a while since I've heard people talk much about copper and beer. I know some have, uh, have a piece of copper fixed in their boil kettle or have... The copper pipe uh, they suspend during the boil. Distillers talk about the importance even more in the dome or column during distillation. How important is copper to you guys these days? We don't have a lot of copper in our system. Uh, the interior of those tanks are stainless. Um, we recently replaced some of the copper parts that were in the, the mash tun. And it hasn't, we haven't seen any changes with the yeast health. It, copper is a micronutrient that yeast needs. So I think we probably get enough of it just from the liquid that, you know, evaporates or condenses, you know, evaporates out of the boil, condenses on the dome, which is still copper, and mm -hmm. then runs back down into the tank. Mm -hmm. um, you don't need a lot for brewing. Uh, he makes a point about distilling and you absolutely need it in distilling. You know, you, and I, I'm not sure this is entirely true, but I've, my experience as well as what I've heard from other distillers is, not that I'm a distiller, I don't have a license for that, I would be illegal. <laughs> um, but if you don't have copper in your process, you can't make, you know, a good, mm -hmm. a good distillate. It's just, it's not possible. Yeah, um, we had a, a, a still and I, I did distilling class at Siebel and all that and, um, yeah, the, the copper in, in distilling can take out a lot of sulfur, a lot of other compounds. Um, you'll see it build up on the copper. Um, uh, and it can be an important part in brewing too, like, like Fowl's saying, uh, you know, it's a nutrient that, that the uh, yeast can use. Um, I'm not sure if zinc also can, can fill that role. And uh, I know, um, you know, magnesium, certain, certain uh, 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 elements will, will take the role of copper. Um, and so I think, you know, most modern brewers are using zinc in some form or another. And I, I, so I don't think that uh, the copper is that important anymore. I think as a home brewer, it's kind of cool if you can work in a copper element to, uh, to your your uh, your process you know you could transfer work through copper or you know a lot of uh, um, you know have a lot of home brewers use a copper work chiller uh, that they, they put in a copper coil and um, you know I, I gotta imagine that's you know definitely helps out in that realm all righty let's see here uh, Meads and Asserglin. Uh Matt uh, writes, uh, Jamel and John, love the show. Just got into it, but have been been binge listening and really enjoy it. I brew a couple hundred gallons per year and wish I could brew more. So early December, I had two fermenters bubbling and I decided I shouldn't brew more beer as the keg grader had two on tap. That brought me to thinking that we have honeybees in the summer and even in every spring we do maple syrup. Well, interestingly enough, both are fermentable. Game on. So I added enough honey to the water to make an OG of uh, 1.130 and then added yeast nutrient and exciter from LD Carlson and stirred the living shit out of it. Tried to push enough O2 into it. I did this for the next four days and the yeast helpers stirred to get rid of CO2 and into uh, O2. 
uh, intro O2. Let's see here. Then I let it sit four weeks at 68 degrees Fahrenheit. The gravity was 1020 at that time, but the nose and taste are really harsh alcohol. I racked it off and have tried it after two months with no change. The Astro Glen maple syrup wine is the same thing. Uh, what do you think is the harsh alcohol smell? Should I bottle it or just leave it in the secondary fermenter? Or is there something I can do to clean it up? I have went out and got some Fermade K for the next batches, but I wonder if you can suggest something to me to save this batch. Repitch, patience. I do appreciate the time. Thanks, Matt. Well, I got to imagine, you know, the issue is, you know, four days of oxygen and stirring. Uh, and maybe too much yeast nutrient and exciter. That could be. That sounds good. <laughs> also, I think the harsh alcohol flavor is probably alcohol. Yes, that's alcohol. Because 1.130 is really, really high. Right. And 1020 is, you know, not crazy low, but that's, that's, that's a lot low. of alcohol in there. Yeah. And if you want to avoid the harsh alcohol flavor, and you're doing everything right. I mean, that's a lot of alcohol. Mm -hmm. But did you ferment cool? Because your warmer fermentation may produce more of those higher alcohols. Um, gosh, other than that, and what you said, I don't, I don't. Yeah, you know, you need free amino nitrogen when you're fermenting a, uh, you know, a mead, uh, yeah. you know, or a or a uh, acerglin. Um, but if you use too much it can taste like rocket fuel in the end. You gotta use just the right amount. And I think the cereal, you know, stirring mm -hmm. and the addition of O2 that way right. might not have been beneficial right. that, you know. I could see adding, you know, a, a, a second dose of, of oxygen, um, you know, after after the first growth phase, another dose of oxygen. Um, but I don't know about four days of it. Uh, yeah, I did it too much. I've read a couple articles in the past that say that, you know, adding O2, you know, you add it with the first, like for guys that are doing multiple brews into a fermenter. Mm -hmm. So the first time you add oxygen, everything's fine. That's normal brew. But you you know push another brew house batch into that same fermenter and add oxygen. That one is actually beneficial, and the, those beers turn out better than the first one with just one batch. The third batch, it's you know shows some signs of diminishment. But if you do it on a fourth and a fifth time, those beers actually don't taste as good, you know, in taste panel as the beers that are done only two or three times. Mm -hmm. So by adding oxygen four days in a row, you might've started creating some of those less desirable flavors. Right, yeah, the, uh, you know, my, my guide is always, you know, generally within the first eight hours, 12 hours, you wanna add that su supplementary oxygen and then pass that. So when you're doing multiple batches into a tank, multiple turns, it depends on when those turns are. If they're coming real quick, that's fine. But if you're waiting to the next day and then brewing and it's later in the brew day, then that's that's bad. Um, so yeah, I, I I think maybe a bit too much oxygen. Anything you can do to save it, maybe. I mean, regardless, the, the alcohol is going to be there. But I think if you added, you know, some bold fruit flavors, raspberry or something like that, um, or you know, something sweeter, um, it may mellow that out a bit. Um, you know, some of those alcohols could over time turn to esters, um, you know, with the acids that are present um, could turn to esters. So maybe, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Tough one there. Tough one. Uh, all right. Uh, let's take our last break. And when we come back, we'll wrap up with uh, questions right after this. All right, we're back. I'm here with my good friend, Fal Allen from Anderson Valley Brewing Company, which is really one of my favorite breweries, uh, especially, especially when you're there. I mean, I don't, I hate to say anything negative, but there was a time you weren't there. 
I didn't think it was as good. And then you came back and uh, returned to the great brewery uh, it always has been. So thank you. You are clearly the key there. I don't know about that, but well, thank you. I, I can highly recommend uh, to all the listeners if you if you haven't tried Anderson Valley Brewing uh, beers, you should you should seek them out. And if you're if you're around the area and you're really close to Anderson Valley, and then you have like three hours to get into the valley and see Anderson Valley, <laughs> it's fantastic. It really is it really is a wonderful visit. It's a beautiful valley, and yes. for those people who have partners who don't drink beer. There are 40 something wineries here as well. So mm -hmm. a little something for everybody. It's a real, real cool place to, to visit. I've, I got to get back out there. Uh, let's see. Uh, Doug writes, uh, hey, all check out my Brew Strong dedicated stir plate. Uh, he sends a picture of a, a stir plate. That's quite cool. Uh, made out of an old car radio and laser etched it at my machine shop. My question is about proper proper etiquette uh, when entering a beer in a competition when part or the entire recipe is borrowed from someone else. If I try to follow a recipe uh, exactly taken from Brewing Classic Styles, should I rename the title or should I just say this is a, a rendition of McZana Chef's We by Jamil? Also, I'm entering two beers for the National Homebrew Competition this year for the first time, and I thought uh, I would consider these my own recipes. It brings up my next question. I want to name my squash beer El Gordo, but of course a Google search pulls up a commercial beer that has the same name. Is it still okay to name it that? I'm new to competitions and I'm just not sure. Thanks to all the Brewing Network for making my beer better, Doug from New Hampshire. What do you think on that? What about the commercial beer thing? If, if if uh, somebody wanted to uh, name a beer and it just for their own personal use and they put it in the competition and it happens to have the same name. It, it's impossible nowadays to come up with anything that has already been done in names. <laughs> right. So unless you're going to get really weird, which yeah. go ahead, get really weird. But I don't think it's a problem. You're talking about a commercial beer and you're a home brewer. They, there's no legal problem you're not you know trying to sell even if they have it copyrighted you you know you're going to use that name once or twice and mm -hmm. if they get bent out of shape about it that's that's their problem right as to the former question about the recipe well <clears throat> my feeling as just me i give our recipe out to whoever wants it because the grain and the hops that you're going to use are you know they're a, a big part of a recipe, but they're not the only part and they're not the biggest part. Your process, how clean you are, the equipment you use, the water you use, and the yeast you're gonna use all have a greater impact than whatever malt and hops you're gonna use. So I think it's nice to say, you know, give a shout out to whoever's recipe you may be using, but I don't think, I don't think you should feel bad about using someone else's recipe because it's your brewery. Mm -hmm. You did it. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I feel the same way um, uh, because if you, anyone who's worked in a commercial brewery with multiple shifts of brewers, you're using exactly the same ingredients. You're using exactly the same recipe or you're trying to, you should. You're using the exact same equipment, same water, everything. Yet the beer can turn out slightly different and you know depending on you know who's brewing and you know it's it may just be a you know a tiny little difference but it's a tiny little difference and so you know if you you know you can give out recipes but that doesn't mean somebody can make the beer you know it's it's so much more than that uh, we used to do a, a show called uh can you brew it where we had uh I, th I think, didn't we have you on Can You Brew It? And it was a recipe you couldn't give us. I think it was like the one recipe you couldn't give us or something. You have one secret ingredient for one beer. That's yes. it. And I think that maybe that was the beer. I don't know. But uh, where we would interview the, uh, the brewers and, you know, small things like the amount of time in the whirlpool, you know, 
all those things really add up the, the amount of time doing transfers. I found that those really play a big role in how the beer turns out and whether you can clone it or not. So uh, it, it, it took quite a bit. So yeah, uh, short answer, you, you shouldn't worry about it. It's, I, I, I'm very honored and uh, pleased when somebody, you know, puts a little, you know, recognition to uh, where they got the recipe sometimes. I mean, that's, that's cool. I like that. Uh, um, friend of mine, uh, Travis, he, he named several of his beers. This might be Jamel's Schwartz beer. This might be Jamel's Doppelbach. This might be. So uh, that was kind of, kind of cool. I like that. Um, but when I come to do uh, the collab, I've got the name already. Oh, nice. Let's get weird. <laughs> I like it. Yep. Uh, let's get weird. That if we did a book together, we could call it "Let's Get Weird." Yeah, we all be fun. weird brewing techniques, weird beer styles. Yeah, and ingredients. And ingredients. Yeah, let's get. Yeah, weird. that'd be a fun book. That would. Well, course, in this. Well, go ahead. If it had smoked beers in it, it wouldn't sell. <laughs> there you go. Well, this has been a fun show. I appreciate you hanging out with me and, and doing the shows. It's very much appreciated. I, I miss seeing you. It's been a while since uh, we got a chance to hang out together. I, I got to I got to make it out there uh, and see you. Um, now that now that I have a little bit more time on my hands, uh, I should I should be coming out and visiting more. Uh, and uh, all you folks who are listening, please, if you get a chance, uh, send an email to feedback at blickmanengineering.com. Tell John Blickman how much you appreciate that he pays for the show. It's the least you can do. You're getting it for free. Uh, it's the only thing I ask of you. And then uh, if you're if you get a, if you're up in Reno, you do yourself a big favor by stopping by uh, Brew Chatter. You'll have fun. Even if you don't buy anything, you'll have fun. It's a nice store. They got lots of stuff. And uh, and the clientele is, is quite fun to hang out with too. Uh, get yourself a beer, chat about beer and brewing or whatever. Uh, I love it up there. A lot of fun. And Reno's a real beer destination now. So that's yeah, make a weekend out of it. Oh, yeah. Make a whole week. <laughs> I go up multiple times a year. Uh, I'm ready to go up again. All right. Till then, everybody. Brew strong. 